Faith Dimensions invites you to understand more fully the subject of righteousness by faith. This is a series of 20 Christ-centered messages from the dynamic new book and study guide entitled 95 Theses by Morris Vinden. Now, with today's message on victory, here is Pastor Morris Vinden. A hundred years ago and a thousand miles away, as they say, one day a man stood up in a church on Wednesday night and he said, living the Christian life for me is victory, victory, victory. Well, he had a problem. Because the closer a person comes to Jesus, the quieter he gets about his own successes. And the more he talks about Jesus instead of himself. And this also presented a problem to other people because there are people in the Christian church and the Christian faith for whom the Christian life is not victory, victory, victory. In fact, with the beginning of the Christian life, it can often be defeat. And later, defeat, victory, defeat, and perhaps later, victory, defeat, victory. But it's true that God is taking everyone who confesses his name toward the point of victory, victory, victory. It's a rough struggle, and people on the road have often gotten discouraged and given up. And there are some who have, instead of leaving the faith, have tried to adjust their theology to meet their standard of living. And so you have some people who say, well, victory is impossible. The only thing we can do is the best we can, and don't worry about it. When Jesus comes, he'll give us the victory then. Well, what does the Bible have to say on this subject? We don't want man's opinion. We want what God says. In the first place, uh, we could go to the last place. The last book in the Bible, Revelation, first three chapters, tells us again and again of the overcomers. Overcomers, the promises to those who overcome. He that overcometh shall be clothed with white raiment and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father. That's Jesus speaking. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me on my throne, Jesus said. And so there is a thread that runs through the Bible right to the end of it that has to do with victory and overcoming, which is a key word that is often used referring to victory. As we consider this, I would like to remind you of something that happened to me years ago. I went off to an old-fashioned camp meeting, and uh, I determined that I was going to buy everything I could find in the book tent on the subject of living the Christian life and of victory. Well, it cost me $3.95. There weren't very many books there. Among the few I found were words that came from a little pamphlet, just a little booklet. I think I paid 15 cents for it. Words that uh, twisted my mind all out of shape. Right in the middle of this pamphlet, the author, whose name was W. W. Prescott, said this, for a long time I tried to obtain victory over sin and I failed. I have since discovered the reason. Instead of doing the part which God expects me to do and which I can do and which he can't do for me, I was trying to do God's part which he does not expect me to do, which I can't do, and which he has promised to do for me. And I said, I beg your pardon? Sounds like some kind of riddle. I had to look at that longer. What is the part that God expects me to do? and that I can do, and that he can't do for me? And what is the part that he does not expect me to do, and the part I can't do anyway, and that he has promised to do for me? 
Well, the author went on to say, primarily, my part is not to win the victory, but to receive the victory, which has already been won for me by Jesus Christ. He said, my problem was that I had been trying to win the battle that Christ had already won for me, and this led me into failure. And then he uh, tussles with this concept. He said, um, I can hear you telling me, but aren't we supposed to strive and to fight? Doesn't the Bible speak of putting forth strong efforts? Yes, yes, he said, it does. But we should be sure for what we are to fight and for what we are to strive. And as he continued this three-page little chapter in this little pamphlet book, something began to click that had been trying to click in my mind for a long time. There's a big difference between the fight of faith and the fight of sin. I had mistakenly thought that the way you fight the fight of faith is to fight sin and the devil. And in the process, I didn't realize that uh, this strange little formula is true. What's the formula? Real victory is getting the victory over trying to get the victory. Do you follow me? Real victory is gaining the victory over trying to get the victory. In other words, people who are victorious, according to Scripture, are not the ones who have wasted their time and effort fighting sin and the devil. They are the ones who have put their effort toward learning to know Jesus and to depend upon Him and to trust Him to fight their battles for them. And the realization that the Son of God fights our battles for us is one of the biggest realizations and breakthroughs in the great theme of righteousness by faith. We've noticed so far in our studies here that um, there's a big difference between sin and sins. Sin is living a life apart from God, and temptation, singular, is the temptation to live our lives apart from God and have no time for Him day by day. We think that we can depend on ourselves. So this becomes a real battle. The battle to surrender or give up on ourselves is called the greatest battle ever fought. To learn to stop fighting sin and the devil, which we can't succeed on anyway, is a tough struggle. It is hard work to accept God's grace as a gift, as a gift. So uh, the problem with self and self-effort is the problem that causes many professed Christians to go down in defeat. We spend our time and waste our time trying to do what only God can do. In order to understand victory, then, we have to understand surrender. Surrender is not giving up our sins. It is giving up on ourselves. It is giving up the idea that we can do anything at all about our sins and spending our time and effort toward looking away from self to Jesus, focusing on Him and His power and His might and His victory, which He has already won at the cross. 2,000 years ago. Now, the Bible says in 1 John 5, verse 4, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So faith is the key word here. Faith in whom? Faith always has to have an object. You can't have faith all by itself. Faith has to have an object, either something that we depend on or someone that we depend on. Uh, you know, it's kind of ironic, but in spite of the fact that this series is on righteousness by faith, there is no such thing as righteousness by faith. It is always righteousness by faith in Jesus, never faith by itself. So the short version of that phrase could be misleading if we don't always correct 
and realize and remember that it's righteousness that comes by faith in Jesus. So the object of our faith is Jesus, 1 John 5, 5, the very next verse, points to him as the central focus of the Christian's faith. Well, how do we get faith in Jesus? Romans 10, 17, of course, is a key text. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It is through the Bible that faith comes, and there is no such thing as Christian faith apart from this book. Well, why does faith come from the Bible? Because it's through the Bible that we become acquainted with Jesus. And becoming acquainted with Jesus is what results in genuine faith. As we learn to know him, we automatically begin to trust him. And the more we know him, the more we trust him. And the more we trust him to do our fighting for us, the more we understand the secret of victory. Now, in Revelation 3, verse 21, we have a key text that tells us that Jesus overcame, which is rather interesting because you don't have to be a defeated sinner in order to have the words overcome apply to your life. Jesus never sinned. He was without sin from first to last, but he is called an overcomer. So you can overcome from a standpoint of victory rather than always from a standpoint of defeat. But it says this, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne, Jesus himself speaking. So we can overcome the same way that Jesus overcame. Again, that's the clue. And Jesus became the greatest single example of how to overcome or how to experience victory. He was victorious over the world and the devil. No question about it. And he did it not in his own strength. He relinquished his own strength. Even though he was God and born God, he did not live as God. He lived as a man, just like we have to live, but through dependence upon the higher power, which was his father. And this dependence came in his daily, personal, one-to-one -one fellowship and communication with his father. Faith, victory, overcoming, always comes in the setting of Bible study and prayer. We understand that even as a youth, a lad, Jesus would leave his uh, carpenter's shop where he worked and would go off in the early morning hours to a quiet place in the hills around Nazareth. And he'd take his scrolls with him, the Bible of that day. And he'd spend a quiet hour alone with his father in prayer and communication. All through his life, this was the secret and the source of his power and of his victory. That's where victory comes from. And there's no victory apart from that. Now, there's an interesting chapter in the Bible that tells us the secret in some interesting terms. It makes it clear that the uh, warfare against Satan, as far as the Christian is concerned, is completely passive. We do not engage in warfare against Satan. But that we are active toward faith in Jesus. So when the enemy comes at us, we don't concentrate on him. We focus our attention on Jesus, the greater power. Let's notice it here in Ephesians, the uh, sixth chapter, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might in the power of his might. I suppose we could have two groups of people here today and who would all be interested in uh, this scripture. We could have group A who believe that uh, the victory is all accomplished by Jesus. Then we could have group B, or perhaps we should call them group F, 
Group F sounds better. Uh, the people who don't believe that the victory all comes from Jesus, but partly through themselves. And uh, we could read it in the, the way that would fit either one. And either one could try and see their own idea in this text. Notice, finally, my brethren, be strong. There you have group F. Be strong. We're supposed to be strong. We're supposed to set our jaws and get our backbone up and uh, really work at it. Be strong. That sounds like uh, good support for group F. But wait a minute. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. There you have group A jumping up and saying, that's it. That's what the Bible says in the power of his might. Well, we continue reading. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And the group F jumps up and says, there it is, we're supposed to put on the whole armor of God and get ready for a fight, for the battle. But wait a minute, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Is there anyone big enough in this world to do battle with the devil? Notice what verse 13 says. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Well, three times already we've had the word stand. Be strong in the Lord, put on the armor, so you'll be able to stand. Stand, stand, stand. Have you ever heard someone say, don't just stand there, do something. This is just the opposite. Don't just do something, stand there. Of all things, this is a standing war. Who ever heard of a standing war? That wouldn't go in the Pentagon. That wouldn't happen out on the battlefront. But that's what this one is. Wherefore, take the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, there's the fourth time, verse 14, stand. Having your loins girt about with truth. There's the first element of our warfare. With truth. What is truth? Well, the Bible is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we're talking about the Bible and Jesus. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. What's righteousness? Righteousness is Jesus we noticed this in our very first study in this series. Righteousness equals Jesus. So here we have Jesus again. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, or the good news of peace. What's that? My, that's a very important element in the armor. The gospel of peace. No one can face the enemy unless he has peace. No one can be victorious unless he has peace, knowing that he's already loved and accepted by God and is in communion with Jesus. He can have peace, and this allows Jesus to go and battle for him. Above all, taking the shield of faith. There we have faith again in the Christian armor whereby ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation. Salvation includes everything that Jesus came to do. Salvation from our past sins, salvation from our present sinning, and salvation from a world of sin. And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Bible again, and the Holy Spirit who speaks through the Scripture. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Now we have prayer. The elements of the Christian warfare all have to do with faith. The things that bring faith. No wonder John says this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. You notice that most, if not all, of these weapons of the Christian have to do with defense, not with offense, but with defense. And they have to do with Jesus and prayer and the Bible, the study of God's Word, the Holy Spirit. 
You know, we understand that the uh, forces against whom we fight in this world, and too often get involved scrapping with them ourselves, are wicked spirits. They're fallen angels. The Bible calls angels spirits, referring to the good angels. In Hebrews 1.14, we're told that uh, they are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who are heirs of salvation. Well, uh, if the wicked spirits are spirits, indeed, and we can't get them out in the open, how can we fight them? They're in another dimension than we are, so we can't fight them. The only way that they can be fought is for us to engage other spirits to fight spirits in their own dimension. And that's where the angels come in, where the Holy Spirit comes in. In fact, Isaiah 59 tells us that the Holy Spirit lifts up a standard against the enemy whenever the enemy comes in like a flood. That's for the Christian who knows the secret of victory. Well, let's just underscore it then today that real victory is not trying to win in the war against the, the devil and sin. Real victory is getting the victory over trying to get the victory and letting the Lord Jesus, who has promised to give us the victory, do the job. Some people say this is too passive, but it isn't because the most active godly people in the Bible were the ones who were passive when it came to fighting the enemy. They put all their attention toward the fight of faith, connection with Christ, and he showed that he was great enough and big enough to win the battle himself. The other day someone gave me a parable. I'm going to read it right here because I think it is so good. It was another one of those old-fashioned camp meetings in the East, and someone handed this to me. It reads this way, I am in a ring, a boxing ring. My gloves are on and I'm ready to fight. And my tag partner is waiting outside the ring. My eyes are cast down on the canvas, which begins to shake and tremble. I look up, and to my horror, my opponent is bigger than I am. He weighs in at 1,500 pounds and stands 12 feet tall, with loose flesh about his jaw and a slanted forehead. But somehow I'm strongly and strangely confident after all, he looks old, perhaps about 7,000 years old. The bell rings. We rise. Before I take my second step toward him, a three-foot glove swats me in the face and I'm out cold. The next round, I am somewhat apprehensive. I plan a new strategy. The same three-foot glove and I'm out cold again. But for some strange reason, I'm still confident. My partner outside the ring has an anxious look of pity on his face. Every time I rise to fight, he leans into the ring so I can tag him, but I don't. After all, someone once told me that he was only the son of a carpenter. Only the son of a carpenter. After 1,000 rounds with my 1,500-pound opponent, I become discouraged and think to give up. Somehow I'm not doing so well and a new bond of friendship begins to develop between my partner and I. I discover that he has fought before. He drops a few names of his former partners. There was Abel, a sheep herder, and a man named Enoch, a shipbuilder called Noah, a father called Abraham and his son named Isaac, and even a woman by the name of Sarah. The list gets longer. Joseph, a leader in Egypt. Moses, a shepherd turned patriarch. Samuel, David, and even a man named Paul. The list begins to look like something I've read in the Bible. I'm impressed. The next time I go to battle, I notice my partner is more anxious than ever to enter the ring. As we spend time together, our relationship grows even closer. He at one point even crawls into the ring to be closer. He wants to be tagged into the fight. And then one day, as my opponent, full of confidence, towers over me, my heart fails. I want out. I'm tired of fighting. Just as I'm about to be clobbered for the 2,000th time, I reach over and tag my partner. In a flash, he's in the ring. 
Through tired eyes, I notice that he enters with both hands outstretched into the air, the sign of victory. And to my amazement, the 1,500-pound bully is on his way out of the ring, completely overcome with fear. The battle is over. It has been won. My partner gives me the victory. And I soon discover that as long as I invite him to remain in the ring, the enemy is totally defeated. My partner and I now spend a lot of time together. I find out that he's not only a superb fighter, but he's a problem solver, a teacher, a comforter, and a guide. Jesus has already won the victory, my friend. That victory was won on a wooden cross long ago, and it's still good today. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for someone who's bigger than the enemy. We're thankful that you've promised to do for us that which we have discovered we cannot do. We pray that you'll teach us better our helplessness and how to give up on ourselves and to trust you and your might. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's the news for the planet Earth, where there are four things that God does not know. God does not know a sin he does not hate. God does not know a sinner he does not love. God does not know a sin he won't forgive. And God does not know a better time than now. Thank you.